Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Damara Smith, Executive Director of the NFL Players Association. As the labor union for professional football players in the National Football League, the NFL Players Association works to assure that the rights of players are protected both on the field and once they retire. Damaris has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Dee, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So we've had an amazing year, an amazing several years in professional sports. There have been all sorts of scandals. We have the NCAA situation where uh, there, there are decisions pending on the unionization of, mm -hmm. of college football players. There are drug issues. Let's talk about some of, the, some of the issues because they not only affect the world of sports, but they start to beg questions about our society and how, how people function together in, in working relationships. Whether it's the issue of um, the players' rights as, as framed by the Northwestern players who decided to go to the, the NLRB, or whether it's a group of the NCAA players who have sued uh, the NCAA over the uses of their likeness uh, to NFL players fighting for what they believe are, are their rights in the marketplace. You know, the common thread through all of those issues, whether it's antitrust rights on one hand, unionization rights on the other hand, right of publicity uh, on another hand, or in the case of the NBA, uh, issues of, of comments from owners and what that means in the marketplace of sports. You know, I see and we see a really unbreakable thread that runs through all of it. And that is, what is the relationship between those who work and, and those who are, are um, uh, owners or, or um, investors. investors in the business? Where is that balance? Um, what does it mean to play a sport in the context of business where at the end of the day, you and I might certainly love the game or love the particular sport or even the particular paradigm in which it's being played. But the core issues there are in each and every one of them, uh, there's an individual who has a certain set of rights. There's an individual who understands that those rights can translate or, or be um, offered in the marketplace in exchange for compensation. And there are owners, operators who want to um, certainly manipulate or utilize those rights for their own personal game, um, gain. And then there's millions of fans who like to watch it. So, you know, to me, um, you know, you take the, the issue of the students at Northwestern that that made the decision to go to the NLRB um, to, to seek to, the right to, to become a union. Um, we've supported them 100% from uh, almost two years ago. And, and that effort uh, by those players, we view as identical of the rights that players in the National Football League sought in 1956. And facing the same risks, the same type of, of sanctions, the same um, issues with uh, how this is going to turn out and how that's going to affect each of them personally for their careers. How it's going to be perceived um, as well. And, you know, in Northwestern's uh, instance, it was a quarterback named Kane Coulter. Um, in, in our instance, it was future Hall of Fame uh, coaches and future Hall of Fame players who did exactly the same thing in 1956. And, you know, the, the interesting thing is it's fun to watch that Northwestern issue unfold publicly. Um, and, you know, at times we, we tend to believe that all of those things, it's the first time that it's ever occurred. Every argument that uh, the university and the NCAA used against those players were the exact same arguments that the National Football League uh, and others used against the players in 1956. It would ruin the game. Um, you should be happy playing the game at this level. Um, you shouldn't be uh, in a position of negotiating issues like um, work day or what happens when you get injured. You already get a number of benefits from this system. You should be content with what you uh, are being given. And the final one that is always interesting is um, you are doing something that everyone else would dream to be able to do. You're in the top 
one percent, one tenth of one percent. Um, be why, great, why do be you grateful. Be silent. And thankfully, um, you know, the players in 1956 decided that no, all of those things are true. But we, as a group of workers, do think that if we get hurt at work, uh, we should be taken care of. Uh, we do believe that if we come to work every day, that there should be limitations on how long we can work, that there should be some sort of oversight um, in order to protect our rights. And yes, our rights, our individual rights are important. And if we seek to monetize them, that monetization balance shouldn't be um, heavily skewed in favor of one party versus the other. One of the biggest issues that uh, affect these, these discussions is what are the obligations of different players within the system, mm -hmm. people who manage others, people who contribute their labor, uh, people who invest. If you take a look at the entire ecosystem surrounding football, for example, are there different obligations that each of the players have that just depends on, on their position? I would argue that when it comes to core obligations of what's fair, um, when it comes to core obligations of what's in the best interest of everyone, I would argue that they don't have different obligations. Um, I believe that uh, our system and any system falls out of skew when one set of stakeholders in a particular uh, lane, track, uh, vein uh, of this game uh, can say to themselves that we have no obligations to fairness um, and other people do. Now in the NFL, there is the recurrence of what um, I could call the North Dallas 40 problem, mm. where, where uh, drugs are being administered mm -hmm. um, in order to deal with symptoms. Sure. Um, and uh, in some cases, perhaps are being overprescribed to the detriment and the long-term health of the, uh, of the players. Talk about, th uh, about that issue that sure. you're confronting. Well, and, and I guess the only thing I would argue is uh, it's not even the reoccurrence. Uh, I'm not sure. That it ever disappeared. It ever disappeared. It, and, and so, um, you know, the position of our, our union from even four years ago when we first started to raise uh, the issues of the care that our uh, men were getting from their team doctors was one that, that started almost four years ago, been elected five years ago, now going into my sixth year. Um, one of our first most public fights was uh, our belief that uh, a particular team doctor shouldn't be the the best <laughs> choice for uh, for the team, um, and we tried to raise that privately. Uh, we chose to 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 really move aggressively because it was a doctor who had been under investigation by the DEA. It was a doctor who had two significant liability judgments, and ultimately, it was a doctor who had lost his privileges at area hospitals. You know, again, the reaction of, of the National Football League to that was disappointing uh, because it seems to me that going back to that ethos, we should all be hoping for the best and striving to achieve the best. Um, and, it, and it did turn into a public fight where we believed that it was our job to protect our men. Now, if that was that a situation where some of the very players on that team took positions opposite to its union. Yes, um, but to me, that's exactly the world where we're supposed to be in. We're looking always at trying to do the best for the largest group of people who are similarly situated. The industry is a, is a closed ecosystem, right. in a sense. There are teams and ownership teams, management teams that have better reputations mm -hmm. in the in the NFL, sure, and some that have less less good, than that, less th less right. good reputations. The players must move between teams unless they take themselves out of the game. Right. So if right. if you're at a at a place where you're really happy with sure. how you're being treated, 
and you face the prospect of moving to a team where reputationally, and you know through your, your friends and your associates, that that's not going to happen. You have very limited choices. Virtually none. And you know, at the beginning, you're, you're drafted into a team where you don't have a choice about where you go. Right. So the, you know, the, the closed loop or the closed ecosystem uh, that we live in has a number of, of interesting ramifications. One, it means that if you are a union representative at a team uh, where everything is good, um, you sometimes see the actions of the union as over the top and unnecessary because you don't know what life is like for a player who's at a team where things are not so good. Right. But the other um, interesting ramification of the closed ecosystem is generally the lack of oversight from other stakeholders who would be um, able to force uniformity or compliance um, in another paradigm. With changing demographics and the changes, not only in our country, but globally, the divisions between how stakeholders aligned have, have changed dramatically. Uh, you have owners, players, viewers, who are far more diverse, mm -hmm. yet sometimes, as we saw in the Donald Sterling case, you have attitudes that, are, uh, that emerge that, that seem to come out of another century in another yeah. country. Uh, talk about the, the issue of ethical conduct, attitudes toward race, mm. poverty, uh, the, the different roles that people play within professional sports. And I, and I think that it has, uh, because communication and media is so uh, cheap uh, and, and, and easy to disseminate, I think that the issue, uh, strangely, is even more pronounced now than, than ever. Um, whether it's the Sterling issue or uh, the European player who was about to do a, 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 a goal kick or a sideline kick and, and somebody threw bananas in relation to racial chants. Um, you know, the, what, what it seems or what it means to me is, is that we as stakeholders and other people you mentioned, fans, um, have to confront this honestly and directly. Um, whether it is deep-seated feelings that bubble to the surface during the course of a telephone call, or whether it is a group of fans who've historically been able to taunt uh, teams or members from other countries, um, rather than simply treat all of those things as unfortunate episodes, it seems to me that it is incumbent on all of the stakeholders to really raise the question of what are we trying to accomplish when it comes to the beauty or ethos of sport? So private speech or private conduct might be private, it might not be actionable in a legal sense, but from the point of view of, of upholding the values and the uh, well-being of the sport itself, the associations uh, can actually uh, take action, and they should take action under those circumstances. Well, and, and many times those uh, rules are collectively bargained, um, and, and the understanding is that uh, we should all be working to um, enhance the integrity of the business that, that we are in. Um, the flip side of it also means that no owner should get a pass for uh, violating the same justification that's being used to punish the player. I would argue that you run the risk that there is a far more substantial injury to the integrity of the sport if you don't punish the conduct coming from an owner to that sport because now you've created um, a clear double standard and I believe that people's uh, reaction to a double standard in many cases is far more um, significant than, than what they would believe the, would be the common offhand, you know, unjustifiable 
uh, comment, maybe said in haste or, or said in um, you know, a, a different context, um, an organization deciding to uphold a double standard uh, to me is an organization that has probably subjected themselves to the greatest uh, amount of, of, of derision um, that you could possibly have. And it becomes a very pernicious act, particularly where, where owners are just as prominent as, as many of the players. When you, when you start to say that a double ch standard is absolutely justified. It undermines everything. It under I mean, it, it, it not only undermines, okay, what conduct is acceptable, it undermines the very sense of how is this organization going to be run. Um, you know, a double standard or, or preferential treatment, uh, issues of bias, you know, those are issues that go to the core integrity of an organization. And now you're not talking about a racist remark or a sexist remark anymore. You're talking about uh, the possibility that the organization itself is being deliberately run in an unfair manner. And to me, that is far more pernicious than, than um, a, a statement or, or a tweet or something that people do, um, you know, sometimes when they're not probably giving it the most thought. Uh, one is uh, stupid. The other one, you can make the argument, is, is deliberate. And this is why I thought the, what the NBA did, although some people have, have uh, argued that the owners didn't have any choice, and perhaps they didn't, but I thought that the way it was, it, it was handled, um, very decisively, with an extremely strong statement, uh, I thought that that, that, that approach, uh, thoughtful, mm -hmm. responsive, um, really ought to be uh, taken very seriously across the world of sports and, and across management circles throughout. No, absolutely, and and you know I I actually praised uh, the the commissioner for taking such a deliberate and quick stance on the issue and decisive. It, and decisive. It, it, it was it was very clear that this type of conduct would result in similar uh, sanction and dismissal. Uh, in the future, it was basically we don't tolerate it, and, and, right. and that's it. Well, and and yeah, I mean, it was a very quick decision, very decisive, very deliberate. You know, at the same time, you know, the first large group of actors or stakeholders in that system, if you remember, was the speed with which some of their sponsors withdrew. Right. So, which is again a, another interesting. Uh, impact of stakeholders who may not be team owners, may not be players, but there were stakeholders in that system who decided really over the course of 24 hours that they were pulling out unless something was going to happen. Now that doesn't change, I, I think, the um, decisiveness of, of the commissioner to act, but it was a data point um, that he certainly appreciated and understood. Um, and so I think that when it comes to the issues of, of, of large uh, thought change, uh, paradigm changing issues within any sports league, um, sometimes I do think we forget the impact that sponsors can have. So you raised um, the, the North Dallas 40 issue of old, obviously triggered by the, the new lawsuit by some players and, and making the allegations about painkillers. You know, to me, one of the interesting issues is going to be, will we see sponsors um, who react in the same way that those sponsors reacted to the comments of, of one of the owners. Right. Again, what's interesting and, and you know, just purely from a, from a thought process, you know, you, again, you talk about a statement of an owner made, you know, however way it was being made. Uh, but, you know, some of the things that the players are alleging in this lawsuit are, are things that anyone would characterize as far more deliberate designed, pervasive, injurious uh, uh, than, than the statement of an owner made over the phone to his whatever that, that could be. <laughs> so, you know, what's interesting is, you know, will, 
will those sponsors react to that? And if they don't react to that, where do they categorize uh, the harm to the integrity of the game on a scale of comment versus course of action? Tamara Smith, thank you so much for sharing oh, your perspectives. Pleasure. And thank you for your insights. Oh, and look, and thank you for, for doing this. I think, um, I think this serves such a large and significant um, uh, public role. And uh, thank you for being involved with it as long as you have. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you very it's much. Pleasure. My pleasure.